Hey, it's Pastor Mike. Have you ever wondered what God is like or what Jesus was all about or how you get saved and what getting saved means anyway? Well, if you've ever felt embarrassed to ask, please don't. I really want to help you understand our big, amazing God. And a great place to start is a little book that I wrote called The Basics, God, You, Jesus, and Faith. And here's more good news. If you're always on the go and don't have time to read, you can now listen to The Basics as a podcast series. Just search for The Basics with Pastor Mike Novotny wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. A while back, our local news had a story that described kind of a scary situation. A, a local deputy chief of the fire department was driving over uh, a bridge, a very tall bridge, on his way home when he noticed a car parked on the side of the bridge, kind of at the peak of the bridge, and he noticed a woman standing beside the car at the edge of the bridge. He pulled over to the side of the road and by looking at the woman, uh, came to the conclusion that this woman was planning to jump. He called for, uh, for reinforcements, for more people to come and help, but after he got off the radio, he got out of his car and he went over towards the woman and he started talking to her, hoping to delay her for long enough that someone, someone could help him get her to walk away from the bridge. He asked about her family, he asked about her life, he asked what was going on, and, and he was able to talk with her for long enough that a professional negotiator finally showed up and was able to get her to willingly walk away from the edge of the bridge. It was a successful end to what could have been a really, a really scary and sad situation. And it's an ending that I think the woman probably did not see coming when she approached the bridge that day. After all, she was there because she was ready to give up on life. I don't know what was bothering her, but I do know that there are any number of reasons a person might come to the conclusion that it's just not worth it to keep moving forward in life. But this week, from the Word of God, we're going to be looking at a passage that reminds us that God believes that you can. Throughout this entire week, we'll be looking at the verses surrounding just one short passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. I like that verse because it's both an acknowledgement from God that life can be sometimes very difficult, but it's also a reminder that the difficulties and troubles of life don't need to stop us from moving forward with confidence. And there's one very important word in that very short verse, and that is the word, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore on the pages of scripture, you need to ask yourself a question. You need to ask yourself, what is that therefore, there for? In other words, there's always a reason. In that verse, Paul says that we don't have to lose heart. That's a big promise. He's saying that no matter who you are, no matter what's going on, no matter what kind of situation you find yourself in, you always have a reason to move forward with confidence. But why does he believe that? What's that based on? Therefore, well, it's based on something. There are a lot of reasons he believes that. Reasons that are based in the future, reasons that are based in the present, reasons that are based in the past, all of which we're going to talk about this week. But to begin this week, I want to remind you just why that therefore, as well as every other word included in scripture, is there. In Romans chapter 15, Paul writes this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's why these words are here. Because God believes you have a reason for hope. He believes you have a reason to move forward. And I'm looking forward to sharing those reasons with you as we go through this week. This week we're looking at 2 Corinthians 4.16 where the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. And I mentioned yesterday that he gives us reasons we don't need to lose heart based on the future, based on the present, and based on the past. Today we're going to look at the reasons based on the future. And to do that, I want to tell you about a former professional football player named Donald Driver. Donald Driver used to play for the Green Bay Packers as a wide receiver. He also won a previous season of Dancing with the Stars, a great dancer. He's a great, he has a big smile when he's, uh, even when he's playing, he has a big smile on his face. And a number of years ago, when our oldest daughter was very young, we took her to watch a practice of the Green Bay Packers. And as we were walking back to our vehicle, when the practice was finished, we saw that Donald Driver was walking uh, was walking on the other side of a fence that we were close to. He was walking back to the stadium and we thought, boy, wouldn't it be great to get a picture of Donald Driver holding our little daughter? And so we got Donald Driver's attention and asked if we could hand our daughter over the fence to Donald Driver so that, uh, so that we could get their picture taken with them. And I want you to imagine how big you would smile 
If you are getting your picture taken next to a professional football player who also won Dancing with the Stars, big, big smile. Well, I wanted to show you the smile that was on my daughter's face when we handed her over. She didn't smile at all. She was absolutely terrified. Donald Driver, of course, he had his big, he had his big smile on his face and he was, he was very, very happy to do it. Maybe your smile would be different, but I want you to do this now. I want you to imagine what kind of smile you would have on your face if you were standing right next to, not Donald Driver, but right next to Jesus. If Jesus were standing right next to you, the compassionate, gracious, forgiving, gentle Jesus. This is one of the reasons, this is one of the things Paul's therefore is based on when he says that we don't need to lose heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says this, We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. In other words, Paul is saying that we know our future and we know who it's with. He tells us that all believers in the end will be standing right next to Jesus. Literally, he says that Jesus will stand with you in heaven, just like he did as he went through hell, when his life was hard, when it hurt, when there were nails in his skin, when he made the sacrifice that was necessary in order to guarantee your future with him. He did that so that you could walk through life knowing that you always have a future to look forward to and knowing that you always have a reason to live. Today we're continuing to talk about 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. And we're talking about the reasons we don't need to lose heart. Yesterday we talked about a reason in the future. Today I want to share a reason about the present, that we don't need to lose heart. And we find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Where the Apostle Paul writes this, he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Did you notice what he called your troubles? He called them light. This kind of sounds like he's calling them easy. Is that what you call your troubles? You know, when you're faced with a situation, a hard one that looks overwhelming, when you're face to face with the same temptation that got the best of you last time, when you're in a situation that's just really troubling, that's light, that's easy, right? No, it's not. And Paul's troubles weren't light and easy either, and yet he calls our troubles light and easy in comparison to something much bigger. In comparison to a promise, a very big promise that we get to live with in the present, that God is using our troubles and our pain to achieve for us a far bigger glory. I have uh, one, my, my grandfather could, uh, could build anything and he could also take anything apart. If you went into his workshop or into his, one of his many barns, you saw jar after jar after jar of all the different pieces of things he had taken apart over the course of his life. He saved everything because he believed that every little piece had a purpose, either in the present or maybe down the road. Every piece had a purpose. And God believes the same thing about your life and in particular, the pain and the troubles that you go through in your life. Your pain always has a purpose. God does not allow any piece of your life to go to waste. There are many different ways that God uses our pain to accomplish something good, but Paul talks about one particular reason in the verse that we read. He uses your pain to keep your focus on the greater glory that is coming. God knows that sometimes our hearts get a little bit too attracted to the comforts and the treasures and the pleasures of this world, and so when he sees that happening, often he will take them away to keep our lives in perspective so that we are reminded that heaven is our true home and that earth isn't. He will often use our pain in the same way he did in the life of Job, in the life of David, in the life of Joseph, in the life of the Israelites in the wilderness to redirect our attention back to him, to the God who has prepared for us a great future, to the God who never leaves us in the present, and also the God who did something very significant with the past. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. A young man named Bryce is 20 years old and he graduated from high school this year. Bryce was born with severe spina bifida, which means that he was paralyzed from the chest down. He's had kind of a hard life. He's been through a lot. He's had dozens and dozens of surgeries. When he was born, doctors said he wouldn't last beyond 
18 months, but he did. And in addition to graduating from high school this year, he was also named the Homecoming King, which is pretty exciting, but there's one thing that Bryce had never done. He never walked, and he wanted to, for his graduation. So over a year before his anticipated graduation from high school, he started working with a personal trainer and a physical therapist uh, many hours a day, exercising. He had to be fitted with special braces and what are called quad canes. He had to learn to walk with them, which require an unreal amount of endurance and upper body strength and, and stamina. And finally, it came the, uh, the day of his graduation, and he was standing on one side of the stage, and the diploma was waiting for him on the other side of the stage. And when they called Bryce's name, his physical therapist let go of him, and he took his first step, and then another, and then another, and then another, all the way across the stage until he reached his father, who was holding his diploma. Bryce had been through a lot, but he kept going, and you can too. Not because you have a diploma waiting for you, but because the God who is holding your future, who is using your pain for a purpose in the present, did something really significant in the past. He kept going through the whip, through the nails, through the crown of thorns. He kept going, not because it was easy, not because his pain was light and momentary, but because he wanted every person who has ever felt weak, alone, broken, or guilty to know that they will one day wear a crown of glory. And that's where the Apostle Paul tells us to fix our attention when our lives are not so easy. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. In other words, we live by faith in a God whose care for our lives in the past, in the present, and in the future is perfect. Braden was four years old when he was diagnosed with a very rare form of brain cancer that has a 0% survival rate. But still his family tried to fight it. Over the course of the next year, he went through 30 radiation treatments. But Braden died at age five. At his funeral were six very special guests. They were Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Iron Man, the Hulk, and Thor. In fact, they were his pallbearers. He loved superheroes. And before he died, he requested that his pallbearers at his funeral be the superheroes that he loved so much because he loved the thought of his super friends staying by his side to the very end. And isn't that what we all want? The promise that someone super will stay by our side to the very end, no matter who we are, no matter when we die, no matter what we've done? And isn't that exactly what we see when we look at the cross of Jesus? Jesus was more super than anyone. He healed the sick, he drove out demons, he walked on water, and yet in the moment of his greatest pain, when he could have saved his own life, he didn't. Because something meant more to him. It was you. And it was your salvation. Jesus stayed on that cross because he wanted you to know that you have one super friend who will stay with you to the very end. Someone who will pay any cost to forgive us of any sin that has separated us from him and someone who, unlike those six superheroes, actually can open the casket, give life to your body, and take you to the one place where you will never hurt, cry, or go through one more radiation treatment. All of that is why the Apostle Paul says very simply what we've been talking about all week. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. It's going to be okay, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, because Jesus, your super friend, is with you to the very end.